Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome to our second episode of the Access Pay podcast. My name is Lucy Rue and I'm Head of Content and Communications at Access Pay. So I have two lovely guests with me this morning. We have Jack and Max. Um, do you want to introduce yourselves? Max, do you want to go first? Hi, I'm Max. I'm Head of Partnerships at uh, Fennec Financial. Perfect. Hi everyone, my name is Jack Clancy and I'm the Head of Service Delivery at Access Pay. Great. Good stuff. All right. So this morning, we're just going to have a bit of a chat about Fennec, um, where you fit into the market. Obviously, we work together as partners at Access Pay and a bit more about sort of the digital digitalization of the finance function. It's something that gets banded around quite a lot. So we're just going to unpick that a little bit and see what it means to both sides. So can we start with you then, Max? Could you tell us a little bit more about um, Fennec? and sort of what the solution's all about. Sure. Give us a brief. Okay, so Fennec provides an intelligent platform for automating payments and finance and treasury. So what we do is we help our clients take complex payment ecosystems or finance and treasury tasks, and we make them simple to operate. And this allows our clients to take costs out and to rapidly scale their business in a very cost-effective way. So we provide an easy way for our clients to link their main business applications directly with the cash movements on their bank accounts, both for outgoing payments and incoming receivables. But the one thing we don't do is we don't physically move the cash. And that's why we need uh, partnerships with businesses like Access Pay that can help link Fennec with multiple banks and uh, payment rails. So the businesses was formed in May 2017. So we're just coming up to our fourth birthday. Uh, we have a number of blue chip corporate clients and my role is to build long term strategic relationships for the business, both as a channel to market and to further enhance the services we provide. And, uh, you know, that's why we're partnering with Access Pay so we can do both those things together. Okay, perfect. And so tell me a bit more about the background of Fennec then. So how did it come about? Um, is it from, am I right in saying it's developed from some sort of insurance product? Is that where your core market was to start with? Uh, well, the, the team members of Fennec certainly met on a joint initiative in my previous job at Exchanging, where we did a joint venture with Deutsche Bank. Its fundamental basis is in corporate transaction banking. So most of my colleagues, apart from myself, are experts <laughs> in corporate transaction banking. And it really came from our founder, Emmanuel de Rezier's uh, realisation that he was selling a range of complex banking services to large corporates. Uh, two things he realized was, you know, the technology he was selling perhaps wasn't the most up to date or integrated. And the second thing was that if you're a large treasurer of a large organization, you have to deal with multiple banks. And each of those banks are selling you the same range of services and none of them talk to each other. So the, the difficulty for the treasurer is trying to stitch all those different systems together. And we've effectively created one single platform to be ultimately an in-house virtual bank for corporates. So that's the big strategic goal of what we're trying to achieve at Fennec. And so what's your background then, interestingly? Oh, my background? Uh, well, <laughs> I, won't bore, I won't bore you with the whole background. We'd be here. <laughs> a brief idea where you've... <laughs> I, won't talk, I won't talk about my 10 years running restaurants because it might not be uh, very applicable. Yeah, it's, it's happened, no. it's fine. Uh, um, so in the last 20 years, I've be basically been working in large corporates, working in BPO technology, primarily within the commercial insurance market. And it was in that market that we kind of came up with the idea of creating a global clearinghouse for insurance. And that's where we partnered with, with Deutsche. So, uh, but I've also spent the last five years as CEOs of a couple of other fintechs. So this is my third fintech uh, and I've been in the business for about three years. Oh, okay. That's perfect. Um, so you've, uh, this is your third fintech. You've You've been uh, sort of going through the ranks a little bit then. You've up to speed with the, the world of fintechs. How have you seen it change? Well, well I'm, st I, I, I'm, I'm going to be 60 this year, but I'm still, still learning all the time. <laughs> so, um, you know, there are, we've got a very specific set of challenges for our, this particular business, which is how does one effectively sell SaaS enterprise systems, especially around finance and treasury? So... Uh, you know, what both of us are doing, are we're working in the heart of what a business does, moving and collecting cash. So it's really important to get that right. 
and people have to place a lot of trust in you to get that right. So it's a complex sale and it's quite a, quite a long sale. Uh, so we're spending quite a long time on working out the best way of managing that sales process, I think. And I think that's really interesting then um, that you mention the fact that you're still learning all the time and that obviously fintechs in a way are, are still kind of new to the market in some respects when you're talking about in big incumbent um, you know, financial systems and the fact that uh, we're now trying to um, plug them into all these different banks, which is obviously what Access Pay uh, are experts are. So I kind of want to move then to sort of this idea of digitalizing um, finance operation and especially sort of what your experience is, and maybe this is a good one for you, Jack, of the sort of, you know, the CFO level actually getting involved with this sort of digital transformation. How close do people need to be now in these leadership roles to actually the providers like us, I guess, you know, is that sort of happening more, would you say? Um, it's an interesting one because I think what, what we find in particular and the, the projects we work on is that the, the CFO may be the initiator of, of the project or the, the digital transformation, but they're not always the, the boots on the ground, if you will. Um, depending on the size of the company and who you're working with, um, it can vary. So, you know, if you're a big multinational um, company, the CFO is not going to be involved in the project. But if you are a smaller, more agile company um, who's looking to make a change, then yes, the CEO may be that person as the project sponsor initiating the change, but the one who's kind of keeping an eye on things, things as well to, to make sure they are moving on at, at the right pace. It's important to note that the C CFO does play a huge part in this. I think we, we've seen time and time again that um, some projects may um, may stall or may not go as the, uh, as it, as it, the plan is, but it's the CFO that often keeps us on track and, and keeps things moving as that sponsor and has, as that senior steer within our clients. I don't know what your experience is of that, Max. Yeah, so from a FENIC perspective, I've always seen the challenge has always been this, which is every large corporate that we talk to all has the same sort of problems that we fix. So they all have highly manual processes, inefficient processes, difficulty in cash forecasting. The challenge is they've probably been that inefficient for a long time. So, you know, why change? So the question is not, have they got problems we can solve? The question is, are the problems material enough for them to take action to fix? I think that's an interesting point, actually, Max. You know, it goes back to the old saying of, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. But actually, it, just because it isn't broke, it doesn't mean it, it, it doesn't require an uplift or an upgrade. I think with finance and the processes that, that the finance team are working on, uh, salary, you, you know, accounts payable, what you see is that, there is a lot of pressure to make sure these payments are being delivered and these financial processes are, are being worked through correctly. Changing that, do people see it as there's a degree of risk and they don't want to upset the apple cart? I guess then, what do you think in your both your experience is the tipping point? Because I guess, like you say, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But then if they want to, you know, if they're looking at growth in the future or what do you think is the main catalyst to say, actually, it might not be broke, but we can't continue with the same systems for the next five, 10 years and still grow in line with the market. Yeah, so what, one of the kind of phrases we use is we, we work with companies to help them fix material pain points that are either limiting their ability to operate or limiting their ability to grow. So it really needs to be a pain point that's causing problem at the sea level. So, you know, we very much sell at sea level. So it's either that something is badly broken and you know it's causing lots of error in the business and, and it's costing money to the bottom line or it's bringing them into not being able to uh, uh, cope with regulatory compliance. Or the second thing is they want to scale the business and the business is growing rapidly and the middle to back office system simply can't cope. So you know it's when you've got a, a step change in scale. So I, I have a technology today, it can process a thousand transactions a day, but actually I need it to process 25,000 transactions a day. So we very much focus on talking to, and we primarily talk to CFOs, CROs, and, and treasurers about, you know, what's the material pain points that are keeping you awake or, or you've got the CEO on your back complaining that either they can't get the right management information or that something's broken and it's costing them money. 
Would you agree, Jack, in terms of the sort of implementation projects you've been on, um, the catalysts for change that have brought them to access pay? 100% yes. You know, I, I was thinking about this myself over the weekend and you know, what, what causes that initiation? You know, you've got an incident or an issue. You've got a, some, a, a process which is very inefficient or has, is unable to scale at the, at the speed that the customer needs. Um, and then sometimes what we found is a new hire, you know, somebody comes into that business who has experience of digital transformation and who is, who comes in and, and looks at the process and, and just sees ways instantly that it can be, can be improved. And that is something that we have a lot of experience with, and we've seen time and time again, um, you, you raise a very good point about the regulatory compliance we've seen over the, you know, even over the past two years that our existing customers and new customers are coming back to us with more asking more and more questions for security compliance and regulation so that a lot of the times a customer will join us and they're being told by their audit or their compliance team that they need to improve their processes to make them more secure or to automate them it, it's it's a, a need that's not just driven by the cfo but it's actually being driven by other parts of the business as well Jack, I think you raise a really good point there, which is a lot of this is down to the personality of the CFO. So, yeah. you know, our holy grail is obviously to find an advocate within the business. And you can talk to two identical businesses and you can have a very kind of passive CFO, which kind of doesn't want to do very much. And then you can have the somebody who really wants to change things. Uh, it's, it's, it's always easy to be the status quo. It's sometimes difficult to be the change merchant because when you do change, things can go wrong and you could lose your job. But um, you really do need somebody. So we talk, we talk, when we talk about the businesses we approach, we want to see two things. We want to see ambition. In other words, the company wants to grow and change rapidly. And we want to see vision in terms of the person that we're dealing with has strategic vision of what the end game is going to look like in their target operating models of finance and treasury. If somebody just wants to go out and buy a bit of off the shelf kit to fix one specific problem, because it's today's problem, okay. But actually what we're looking for is visionary leaders with a strategic vision for the business. Now, I don't want to sound controversial here, Max, but I, I'm, I'm going to throw it out there. But, you know, I, I'm not sure I, this is, it's not my opinion. It's just a thought. But do you think that it's almost as if there, there needs to be some form of shift, uh, be that a generational shift within the finance function to, to see that the, the future leaders of finance who are maybe more open to digital transformation it's, it's those that are driving it or are you seeing it across the board from finance professionals who've been in the game for 20, 30, 40 years? I think if you've been in the game for 20 years and lived with a relatively high level of inefficiency, you're, you're not actually that uh, keen to make the change. I think the, the real driver for change, uh, like, like any driver for change, is actually external competition in the market changing. And if I don't change, my business isn't going to be here in, in five years. So that's that's... And of course... What the fintech world is doing is it's demonstrating to the bigger legacy corporations lot more, a lot more nimble and clever ways to operate. And then you've got the, the per, perpetual challenge of a fintech is do I compete or do I partner? And most fintechs find, unless they've got huge fundraising, that actually competing is very difficult because distribution is hard and expensive to win. And I could have the best mousetrap in the world, but I haven't got, I, you know, I haven't got the brand uh, brand width to attract the customers, I kind of struggle, which is why you see a lot of the banks actually acquiring some of the smaller kind of fintech lender players, because it's that for them, it's a short track to digital transformation. And also it's outside the legacy. So yeah. then, you know, changing legacy is tough. We all know that changing legacy is tough. Um, yeah. So uh, it's all about finding a CFO who's ambitious enough and has the vision to manage those change and probably the business is under external pressure to change anyway so you, you mentioned legacy systems and, and legacy tech quite a lot there max and what i find interesting is that what we're seeing from access pay is a shift away from huge legacy monolithic erp installations where it's one system that takes two years to implement that effectively does everything that a business needs and there's a lot of time and effort that that's needed to upgrade that and what the change we're seeing is effectively people moving towards this notion of what they call in a postmodern ERP, where um, you can have multiple different SaaS providers and cloud technologies to do different tasks within a finance function, within a processing function, which all then are linked together so that you can deliver multiple tasks quickly and efficiently. 
Is that where Fennec fits in? It does, but I, I really like your phrase, postmodern ERP. I, like, I think I might have to, <laughs> might have to steal that. It also, it also gives, we can have some really kind of sexy artwork as our brand because we're a post, <laughs> postmodern deconstructionist ERP. We're going to, I'm going to go with that. Um, yeah, this is sort of degree level. <laughs> so what we've, uh, what we've done with Fennec is we've, we've effectively built a very robust B2B enterprise system, which can handle, you know, SAP scale volume of transactions a day. But we've built it in a way which means that people can consume it on a, on a relatively small piece by piece basis. So beneath it, you've got this big heavy enterprise, but actually you can play and consume in a, in a relatively small way. So a bit like HubSpot competing with Salesforce. HubSpot is actually a very big enterprise system, but I can play with it and consume it in a very uh, easy way for me to consume. And that's basically how we've architected the platform. Underneath, it's enterprise scale but you can play with it in a, in a very light touch way. And then we can take you on a strategic journey to, for you to consume more and more services on the platform. I think that's, I think that's quite important, isn't it? Then in terms of looking at FinTechs and where they fit together, that you sort of provide a very specific solution. And like you were saying earlier, the challenges, do we, um, you know, do we grow or do we sort of partner with someone who's already an expert, which is kind of where we both fit in. So I guess, how do people make that decision about, is it time to partner? Do you think it's kind of more popular now and especially in this space to partner with an expert rather than trying to do it all yourself? Gosh, well, I think there's probably a different answer for every different partner that you look at. The, you'll always have, I mean, it's, it's about where people think their core IP lies. So if, they, if their core IP lies in the activities that we undertake, they probably don't want to partner. If you're, you know, hopefully sensible and say, actually, that these tasks that, that Fenix Helping Automate are, are, are relatively commoditized tasks, they're not our core IP, uh, then people are much more open to partnering. But there is always the dreaded CIO who says, well, my team could build that. I've got, I've got a team of 100 people in Pune. They, they could build that. It'd only take them a couple of months. Why would we want to use these guys? And that's your that's that's always your fear coming up against the CIO who wants to maintain his or her power base with the development team they've got. And does that happen quite often? Is it is that something that's quite tricky to navigate? It's always it's always a barrier, and and there's no way you can get past it really, unless it depends who holds the power in the organisation who's got the. You know, I've worked with a couple of businesses where they openly said, we really like your solution, but you know, ultimately I have to go with my CIO. They're our technical expert. Um, I'm not gonna override them. And if they say that we can build it ourselves and it's gonna be ready in three months, then you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not going to override them. So it's all, that's always a tricky, I, I, like to, I like to wait for the phone call six months later when they say, you know that <laughs> thing we tried to build, we, we haven't started yet and we'd quite like to get on, on do it. So I think you know, speed of execution is key. That's another kind of sales driver, isn't it? You know, we need to fix this now and quickly. Um, and you can only really do that if you partner with somebody that's a kind of expertise in a, in a, in a niche area like we are. And would you say the same in Access Pay Jack? Obviously, our implementation team, which you overlook, the fact that we can get people, you know, up and running within, would we say, weeks? I guess it depends on the, the scope of the yeah, project. Exactly. I think, you know, we, ha we are experts and we do what we do because that's what we do day in, day out. It's what where, where we have built our product. It's what we want to do. And it's where we focus all our efforts and energy is, you know, reducing that time to value and making sure the return on investment is delivered as quickly as possible. It, you know, Max made a very interesting point there. Looking forward to the customers coming back to him in six months time when, when they failed to complete the project. You know, we've seen that time and time again ourselves we've had customers come to us on the back of a failed internal project we've had customers come to us that we've effectively lost because the in, internal IT have said they can deliver it but what we do find is that a lot, IT departments are often one of the most stretched teams within um, customers and they plan their workload weeks months in advance so putting something a project like Max has talked about or a project like what we do within access pay into that mix you're gonna to have to wait weeks and months before you can even start it and never mind trying to work through the issues of that of a, a new system to implement that they have zero experience of i think um fintechs um, and all the different SaaS technologies available now offer 
very affordable solutions which are very flexible to meet most biz business needs and that's why you often see these companies partnering together because they do work very well with one another like ourselves and fenex to work very well and you know the underlying customer who uses the fenex system which is connected to access pay they will have had a almost seamless journey to, to, to using that system and wouldn't have had to go through a myriad of different problems and projects and different engagements so it's it's important that they do consider SaaS and fintech when, when they go into these projects. Yeah, so I, I think if we talk about you know the clients we've worked on, and I won't name names for confidentiality, but we'll give it kind of general terms. So I'm trying to guess, okay. Uh, so <laughs> a large a large U.S. global cash in transit transit business that uh, between the two of us, we've helped them build a brand new cash network in France. I mean, working together, you know, we did that in a, it's a it's a complex deployment we've done the whole project took six months from start to end and it wasn't either our bit that took six months it was actually trying to get you know you know jack that the biggest barrier was actually getting the bank's team to play and connect with something which was really straightforward so i think you know we always say and certainly with our partnership with access pay there's a real step change of our competitors both in speed to deploy and in cost because actually we've both built systems from the ground up that are, you know, sophisticated, but actually very quick to deploy because we, we, we're using the latest technology. So there's a real speed to market competitive advantage that we've got together, um, which I think is incredibly powerful. And taking that back to your early point, um, Max, about partnering and, you know, do you partner or do you compete? We, we never see, we don't see ourselves as competitors to banks. We see ourselves as to be partners with banks. And, you know, we are constantly looking at improving on ways we can engage and, and make those processes even quicker. And in the example you've just provided for one of your customers, unfortunately, the, the bank did slow things down. But, you know, after the end of our project, myself and the team, we sit down and, and look at that and go, well, okay. What can we do better next time? Is there something that the bank, maybe where the bank might not have been efficient, how can we help make the banks more efficient? And with banks that we are um, engaged with more frequently, we will often talk to their implementation teams and, and the, the leaders in those areas and try and establish ways of working which can ultimately improve the journey for yourself and then the, the underlying customer as well. So it's something we're constantly trying to improve upon. And I guess put that back onto a finance process, what you're delivering is, is ways for these, these companies to improve as well. Could we unpick that a little bit then in terms of that project specifically? So I know we don't want to mention any, um, any names for confidentiality, re confidentiality reasons, but could you tell me a bit about how, how it came to us? Well, I guess it came to Fennec first. What was you know, the driver behind um, what they were looking for? What were, the, what were they trying to solve, I guess? So the pro problem we were trying to solve is they, um, the company wanted to create a new cash network in France to rival the basically all the cash tills that sit in all the banking network. So they wanted to create an alternative cash network from which you could either pay bills or take cash out, make deposits. And the, the idea was, which is an idea we're familiar with in the UK, which is basically using all the local tobacco and newsagent tills as cash tills that could be linked together. So the challenge was, how do I connect the cash tills of six and a half thousand different tobacks, link them into the client, uh, link them into the merchants that wanted to use the system, uh, and also link into the banks that we want to use for the actual physical movement of cash. And I think when they were looking in the marketplace to find somebody who could do that, that's an extremely heavy piece of lifting Lots of, lots of um, EPOS systems to connect to, banks to connect to, reconciliation tasks to be done. And potentially that could cost you millions to build. Needless to say, it didn't cost them millions because we're, we're, we've got a much more cost-effective way of doing it. So it came to, it came to us through our, you know, our, our senior relationships with this global company and our, specifically our relationships in France. And... Um, I think they've been very pleased with with what we've done and we we got them up and running working very closely with access pay in, a, in very very quickly and you know this is going to be a big network this is a network that's going to process millions and millions of euros and there's been a lot, a lot of coverage on the um in the french press so uh yeah it's, it's been a very exciting project 
it certainly put, helped put Fennec on the map and hopefully it'll help put our relationship with Access Pay on the map as well. Can I ask that? And I'm really fascinated by this. What was the need for it to be sort of cash driven? Is this for like an older ah. generation? Ah, it well, seems quite funny to bring, bring a FinTech in to uh, pay cash physically into tobacco stores. It's, uh... So when I first heard about the project, I must say I was super skeptical. Why would somebody want to build a cash network when everybody's stopping using cash? was my assumption. So it, so it works out of fact, when you actually look at the stats, of course, in the general population, cash is going down, but actually in, in, in France in particular, the cash use is growing. Um, there is a large part of the population that is excluded from the credit card market and still deal largely in cash. So there's a disenfranchised group of people who need access to cash services. Governments are very worried about disenfranchising a part of the population who aren't credit worthy. Um, but interestingly enough, one of the new clients for the service is a big bank itself. So why would a bank want to plug into somebody else's cash network? And the answer is, well, like most banks, they are trying to take their costs out. So actually being able to close a local branch while still providing local support for paying bills and cash via a tobacco is an incredibly cheap way of main, still making sure my customers can be serviced. And it's also a lot cheaper than establishing a new ATM network. So the one way of thinking about this service, it's effectively turning the tobacco cash till into a, an ATM, a, 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 ma, a personed ATM. So, um, so what we're seeing actually is more and more people coming to the service because they still need to offer. And in, in fact, in France, it's the law that you must be able to offer the service that you're selling to be paid for in cash. So actually what we've helped our client do is build a very relatively cheap cash network for suppliers to use, which is much cheaper than having a branch in every town staffed and opened, you know, all the, all the hours that you need to do. So it sounded counterintuitive, but actually it's, uh, it's, it's growing very rapidly. Yeah, I'm sold, Max Walden. I think <laughs> you're well versed in that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that's, that is really interesting. And and it, yeah, it did seem counterintuitive at first, but it makes perfect sense um, from what you're saying. I guess it's a bit like uh, what we use post offices for, perhaps, when yeah. bank branches well, are being closed. There's, there's pay point in the UK. I mean, we're all familiar with going down and paying for your electricity bill or charging your card or, you know, picking up a parcel. So there's this whole thing of using your local, and it saved the local convenience store, actually, is, is oh. having this multiple use of, especially with the closure of so many post offices. Um, so it's and it's just the same in, in opportunity in France and you know this company wants to take this service all across Europe and so that's a potential great growth opportunity for both Fennec and Access Pay. And so how did you come to partner with Access Pay then? Is this the first time that you'd come across um, the business and you know how did you choose us against other fintechs I guess? So we talked to we probably talked to four or five different you know, like third party Aggregate, I mean, I don't know how you describe yourselves, but third party payment aggregators where you can have kind of one core API connection. Um, and like most things, actually, it's when you engage with the business, Access Pay was the, the, the most engaging to deal with. Uh, I know Access Pay is a bigger organization than Fennec, but it, it felt like we were dealing with people with a, of a kind of similar culture and, and mindset. Um, you had the capability, you had the willingness to do it. Uh, and I think a lot of this is, a lot of it's personal chemistry about, about this feels like an organization we can work with. And so I think, you know, it's always about have they got the right technical capability, but I think there's quite a lot of it about what are, what are they like to work with as an organization as well. And in terms of... Okay. That's a good, you know, I think it's it's important that, Max, because what we see is, you know, we pride ourselves on these types of engagements and it, we don't offer a kind of an out of the box relationship management, if you will, we, we treat every customer differently. We know each customer or each partner has completely different needs and requirements. So we, we aim to fit their exact requirements. We don't want to just be doing a lift and shift and the same thing time and time again. It's, you know, it's the same for us, how our sales team engage and our partnership team. It's the same how our implementation team engage and also our support and customer success teams. We want to offer that personal service and make sure that, everyone that we speak to you know feels comes away thinking this is a partnership not a traditional supplier and vendor relationship where you're just paying for a service we want it to be our partnership 
Yeah, and I think also, if I'm, you know, being super honest, uh, we want the relationship to work both ways. So, so we believe that by combining Fennec with Access Pay, we can actually take deeper, wider services to the existing Access Pay customer base, which in the long term will make Access Pay even more valuable and sticky to their customers because they'll be integrated in a much deeper way into the into the organisation. Because because we can help businesses like Access Pay, you know, reach in and connect quite deep within the organization. And for the organization, it, may, it feels like a completely seamless integration. Um, so, you know, we, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's both a, a partnership in that you can help us enhance the services that we take to our clients, but we ha also hope it works the other way, which we can help you enhance the services that you take to your clients. Yeah, and I think that's the sort of true nature of partnership, isn't it? That it works both ways and that you're both sort of benefiting from um, the collaboration. So, you know, hopefully there's more of that to come. Um, so I just wanted to sort of round up then. Um, I wanted to maybe talk a little bit about the sort of benefits of digitalizing the finance function. So um, obviously we've talked a little bit about the solutions that we offer and together the kind of things that we can do with the example that you gave. Um, but could we just talk a little bit about then if you were working in one of these finance functions, what what would it be like sort of, you know, what would the knock on effect be for you? I'm thinking about maybe a reduction in you know, manual workload or you know, what are the sort of tangible benefits for a business to, to bring on someone like Fennec or Access Pay? So I think I'd, I'd break it down into a, um, kind of three core areas. Um, first is about taking cost out. So often we're replacing processes that are people and spreadsheets. Uh, it's often, you know, how do people bridge the gap between their business application and what's happening on the banks? Some of it might be filled by a kind of core business application, but there's lots of stuff. So there's always people with spreadsheets. So there's, there, is, there is always going to be a, a cost out element. And, you know, in the work, the work that we've done, you know, we've seen up to 70% reduction in costs for, for, by replacing it. Um, I think, I think the, the, key, the key thing is the cost out is never going to be the whole business case. The real business case is about uh, something probably more intangible, but you can put numbers on it. It's, it's, well, it could be about getting management information in a more timely way. So I need to close my monthly accounts on day three. At the moment, it takes me to day 22 and I can't get the information I need up to the, the CEO. It could also be about re reducing working capital. So there are lots of cash slopping around in these, in these big companies, simply because they're unsighted as to how many transactions they have in each of their territories. So they have big cash buffers. So if we can help them in their cash forecasting, there could be you know, a 30% reduction in working capital. But effectively, most of the things we're doing is about enabling a step change in scale. So in other words, to be able to run large amounts of revenue through your business with a minimal increase in headcount. So fundamentally to change the unit economics of your business, which goes back to you know my, why I say this needs to be strategic. If somebody's doing something just because it takes 10, 10, a headcount, 10 reduction in, in Pune, it ain't gonna, it, it's not gonna be strategic enough. The upside's not gonna be big enough to cover the costs. So it, it really has to be a strategic program. And I think if you work in that area, what you'll, you know, hopefully what your experience will be is a lot of what I would call the grunt work, the non-value added work, disappears and your role becomes much more value added and dealing with exception management and do, working at a higher level of tasks than simply st stuffing some stuff into an Excel spreadsheet and working with three screens trying to update your general ledger which is a lot of the work that a lot of people do in the areas that we see. And would you say that's sort of similar in access pay Jack in terms of the benefits that our well clients... I think Max has pretty much hit the nail on the head and covered pretty much everything I could have said there but I think what um kind of high level you know traditional finance function people turn around and see it as just some number crunching producing reports for the rest of the business to, to review you know that's very high level I'm, I'm not trying to do the finance function a disservice there but you know becoming that business partner who can deliver that kind of those value added, added tasks is where the, this this transformation needs to take them. Um, you know, we've seen working with certain companies that are scaling up and looking for investment from the market. If you would, the invest an, a modern day investor demands a modern finance function. 
if you are a tech company looking to scale and looking to get more investment fr from the market, then, you know, th those investors will look at the, these types of processes and, and see where you are. And if you are not up to uh, on point with these processes, they're not going to be, they're not going to be as um, likely to invest because what, what we've seen is a number of customers who have joined us over the, over the years who are on the verge of an IPO or looking for investment have, have literally said, we need to improve our processes to secure the right level of investment. And I think that's something that we haven't really touched upon in the, this conversation, but it's something that people do look at um, and especially investors. And if you're, you, you're VC backed and you have a board, they want you to be improving these processes. It's not just um, the bottom line that impacts, it's those relationships higher up as well. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I've never really seen it from that um, point of view before. Do you think that's an element of sort of future proofing? I don't know whether that's one of those words that people hate in business because it's quite uh, nebulous. But... Yeah, it's, it links exactly back to what, what Max has just said, scalability. So if yeah. you're an investor, you're going to pump so many million pounds into a business. You want that business to be able to use that money and scale and improve. And if they do not have the underlying processes, which are able to be scaled and improved, then what is your money going to do? They're going to put, put more money into individual headcounts to help with manual processes. They don't want their money to be spent doing that. They want their money to be spent on, on, on better things that take you forward as a business. Yeah, yeah I, I, think, value, isn't it? I think we had a really interesting experience. I think the investor view is a really interesting view. So we worked with a client that was PE owned. And uh, as you know, PEs are quite tough in that they want to strip costs out and get the business grown and sold in three to five years. <laughs> So the challenge of P firm had set this particular COO was you, you need to modernize and scale up your, um, your, your, your finance and treasury capability. And by the way, you've no money to do it or you've got very little money to do it. So I think where we, where we can help together is, you know, in, instead of them spending huge amounts of CapEx, building that capability within the business, they, you know, they effectively buy our services as, as a service. So you swap a multi-million pound CapEx to a relatively small multi hundred thousand pound spend, buying it as a service from a combination of Fennec and Access Pay. So you can suddenly access and digitalize a lot of what you do, but you're not, it's not a multi million pound three year transformation program. You can actually get something up and running, let's say within three to six months. And so maybe to finish on that, and if someone's sort of watching this and they're thinking, maybe that's me i'm not sure you know we do have manual processes but i don't know if it's at the tipping point yet what kind of advice would you give to people who are maybe starting to think about we need to look at the future we need to start you know modernizing our finance function so i think the, the key thing is is it strategically aligned to the future of the business you know if, if i go to my ceo and talk about this is this something that's immediately going to strike a bell with them that they're going to be excited about and it's in line with what the business is trying to do strategically. If it's not of great strategic importance, forget about it. Or do so, do something simpler, do something easier and more tactical. You know, we're effectively a strategic play. We're not really a tactical play. Um, how think, about you, Jack? Well, I was, I was just going to carry on then for Max. I think, you know, if you can show value in some way, shape, or form higher up the food chain. So, if if at first you get a no from, from the CEO, but if you can look at our process and think, well, actually that's a small enough process for me to take that on and make the change myself and show the value, you can you can show how, how effective digital transformation can be. And then once you've shown that value, you can look at applying that to a bigger process where you might it might be a higher cost output, but the returns might be higher. So it's that, I guess, a phased approach to any transformation. If if you don't want to go all guns blazing at the, the most, um, the biggest piece of transformation, start somewhere small and look at building out from there in phases and, and have a goal of where you want to get to. You know, there may be numerous steps in between. It's like managing any project. You know, there may be milestones you want to hit. Start small where you can manage it yourself. And then once you've shown that it works, begin to scale that out into different processes, different procedures, and ultimately delivering more and more value until you get the right attention from the right people who can help you on, on the final stages of the journey. So essentially sort of building an internal business case and, you know, showing that it can work for, for smaller processes and then getting that buy-in. Because I guess 
actually getting the buy-in from the rest of the business and from the senior leadership is probably some of the hardest part of getting these things off the ground, I can imagine. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting because, you know, Max said a lot of his engagement is at senior C, a kind of CFO level. And if, a, if somebody comes along to us who's not at that level, then they have to maybe think more in, in this kind of mindset of delivering things in a phased way, whereas the engagement Max uh, might be involved in might be more of the high end, more expensive processes where they, they do show a bigger, re, bigger return on investment. But it, it just depends who you're engaging with at, at the customer. Okay, perfect. Is there anything else that you want to finish by saying, Max? Or do you think we've covered quite a lot? I, I think uh, I think we've covered a lot. <laughs> you need to uh, lie down. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully people are still listening. Uh, yeah. So no, no, it's been it's been great to great to have this chat. You know, we really like working with Access Pay, and uh, we very much hope that we'll be doing a lot more together in the future. Good stuff. Thank you very much, Max. I think yeah. we're we're looking forward to the same as well. <laughs>